Hi everyone, welcome to the QA Ops channel. I'm Rafael Lima. And today we won't be talking about coding in, in Java and automation and none of that stuff, but we would be talking we will be talking about a topic that's very important when you have a a, a automation or, or any sort of code, which is pipeline strategy. All right, so we're going to be covering about uh, we're going to be talking about test pyramid and how you can uh, have a pipeline strategy that's going to benefit your project uh, on the daily basis, right? So if you haven't watched any of my videos, I'm going to put a, a a playlist right here on the top about the last videos that series of videos that I created, which was uh, Java uh, building a REST API automation with REST Assure in Java. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so, so you can receive the notifications of my next videos, which I'm going to be talking about Unix, uh, Git command line, uh, Docker, and a lot of stuff related to infrastructure. So we'll be talking about the pipeline strategy for your automated tests. So you can you can do uh, you can do a mix of a pipe of a manual uh, strategy with your automated strategy, but then a pipeline is going to be mainly focused on your automated tests. So the first thing that I would like to say is we need to be good at preventing bugs, not finding them. Because when you find, uh, it means that it's already on production, it's already too far away from the development process uh, in user already found it. So we need to uh, bring it more close to our daily uh, developing work. So talking about continuous integration and continuous delivery. So we have this is this is a very nice image that I like that talks about DevOps, right? So here on the left, we have a, uh, a dev and on the right, we have a ops. So on the left, it's the CI, it's the continuous integration where you start with the plan, with code and building and testing, right? And then on the right, you have your continuous delivery where it's release, deploy, monitor, and so on and so forth. So in uh, the difference between continuous delivery and continuous deployment is when you do continuous delivery, you are deploying to a environment that is not production. It can be QA, it can be showcase, release, whatever environment that you have that you are using to test, to showcase to somebody, whatever. When you deploy straight to production, that's uh, continuous de deployment. Right? So uh, in, in a lot of these strategies to put that feature on a toggle where you can do, you can turn it on, turn it off uh, once it's in production, but on every push, if everything goes at, uh, successfully, through your pipeline, that code is going to go straight to production without any human interaction. Of course, you can you can deploy to all the environments, so you can check on those environments. But then that's uh, uh, that's on the side, right? You are all, all also pushing to production at the end of the pipeline. All right. So talking about test pyramid and how we can we can achieve that pipeline. So this is the ideal test pyramid. This is a very old image. It's still incomplete. There's something still missing, but uh, let me go over it. On the bottom, we have here on the bottom, we have automated uh, unit tests, right? Uh, on the top, you have a component test. We right here, you have component test, which are the tests between multiple units. So or a module or a controller or, or sorry, a package, right? So that's you are testing multiple units inside that module, that package. So it could be a controller calling uh, the model, for instance, and you are checking that. Integration here is talking about uh, integration with the DB, right? You, you, you are trying to integrate with the database. You, uh, you want to test that or uh, integrating with other packages. So there are communication between different packages or different modules. Then you are testing that on your integration cloud. And then have API, which is testing your REST API, and to end test, and then main uh, exploratory testing. Here it's still incomplete because we are still missing UI isolated tests, which is before the end to end test. We're going to be talking about a little bit about that in, 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 the, in the future slides. 
we are missing here contract tests and we are missing also UI white boxing testing because in today's JavaScript world you have unit test for UI as well so it's not here in this image so the idea for this for these images on the bottom you have more isolation you are testing only the unit you are testing multiple units and therefore it's faster because it's easy to create it's very fast to create a unit test uh, and it's really fast to ex fast to execute so it's less human time and less machine resource and that makes it cheaper then when you go up the pyramid you become you, you have more integration right of course you are you, ha you have more reliability on on what you're doing because if one whole and twin gives you more confidence than one unit test right? but then one like a selenium test web driver easily one test takes uh, a, a minute right and with one minute you can you can run uh, hundreds of unit tests right a lot because one unit test one unit unit test is going to take milliseconds right so you can run a lot of unit tests within one minute Right, so as you go up, you are more integrated, right? And you are slower because it takes more time to create a whole unit test. It takes more time to create, to execute exploratory tests. And because of that, it's more expensive. You need more human time to create and to execute. And if you have that, those on a machine, uh, like a Selenium suite, you're going to take more uh, machine resources and that's more expensive too. Right, so the cheapest place to find issues is when that functionality is being developed. So if we, we talk about we, we we talk about the CI area of the DevOps image that I showed, that's during the development life cycle, right? So you are you have a CI that's checking your, your repository that it, they are healthy. Uh, and during that moment, the developer is creating code. It's actually having the whole context of what he's building or she's building in the mind. So in, if an issue comes up, the person already going to be able to check through the automation, going to check the logs and going to see exactly line that is failing. If that's if the issue waits a lot of time to be found, let's say a QA team, uh, you have a developed team and have a QA team or it's found already in production, that means it took some time after that person developed. So even if the issue comes back to the same person that developed, the person lost some of the context, right? Uh, and that's going to take more time for the person to get to get the idea again. If that person left the company, the team, it's on vacation, it's on sick leave or whatever, you, you, you're going to send to another person which doesn't have a context and it's going to take even more time. So it becomes uh, more time consuming, therefore more expensive. Right? And for the pyramid to be effective on the development life cycle, it's necessary to have a fast feedback of the tests. Sorry, there is a typo, typo there. So how, how fast is fast, right? Uh, 5, 10, 30 minutes. I think for me, a whole regression test suite between 10 to 20 minutes to finish everything, it's, it's a good amount of time because the developer can execute the faster tests uh, more often and only a few times a day he can execute the whole thing. So while that person's development can execute the whole uh, black, uh, sorry, the whole white box text testing which is very fast and I mean on every commit on every on every change that a person is doing can execute those really fast I told you again uh, I told in the past it take milliseconds so it, it's very fast but then the whole suite which takes more time that person can execute locally uh, a few times before going uh, before pushing the code right? so talking how that would look like on a pipeline right so the pipeline any pipeline jenkins uh jenkins uh travis uh, circle ci whatever pipeline that you have you have the ability to uh separate it by jobs right so it starts with a push to, to the repository not a commit a push right and in this case i put one job that's going to do a build and it's going to do unit tests, 
right? And you want to, to separate it by jobs because now you have a fast feedback. If my unit test failed or if my build failed, I don't even need to run everything else. I don't need to wait. It just break the pipeline and I can fix it, All right? And it's important, it's important to break the pipeline because if you only set up a warning and let the pipeline go, uh, that means that there is no urgency to fix it. And the hum humans usually uh, only act when there is an urgency. So if it's not failing the pipeline, it's not blocking, it's not going to be fixed uh, with urgency. And after the build and the test, an artifact is, is going to be generated. So like in the Java world, that's going to be a jar. So that jar is going to be sent to the next job, which is component test. And it's important to be passing the artifact of a, a previous job, or, or not necessarily the previous job, but the code that was uh, built, because you don't want to get the new code and run the, uh, the, a new code in every job, right? You want the same code to be exercised by those jobs, because now once you have uh, once you have that code deployed, you can rely that it pass a whole set of regression. All right, so I have a component test. If it passes, I'm going to call my integration tests. If it failed, it bre breaks. Right. If it passes, I'm going to call my API test. So now I have uh, I already finished my white box testing strategy, and now I'm coming to my functional tests and my uh, black box testing. If API passes, I'm going to call my UI tests. And then I'm going to call my end-to-end -end tests. Right? And here, uh, after the end-to-end, -end, so this is what I mentioned. We have API, which is isolated. We have UI tests, which are also isolated. And now I can have an end-to-end, -end which tests uh, multiple services. And now I do, I do a deploy to QA. In this moment, it becomes continuous, uh, de uh, continuous delivery because I'm deploying to a specific environment. Right. If after this, I do a deploy to production straight away without any human interaction, I'm doing continuous deployment. All right. But in this case, I'm going to do some exploratory testing on my QA environment before going to production. All right. So if I, what if I don't have the ideal test pyramid? Right. So one of uh, another uh, famous pyramid is the ice cream cone. Right. So it's the same idea applies. Uh, more on the bottom, you have you are more isolated and you have more you are faster and cheaper. And on the top, you are, are more integrated and slower and more expensive. The difference is the amount of tests that you have in each area. In this case, you have more tests towards the top. All right, but what can you do if you have this pyramid? Right? So the first thing that you could do is you have unit tests for every new code. So every new code that you're going to be created, you put unit test. What about old codes? Old code is going to be tech debt. Really rarely a team is going to be stopped to or prioritize uh, a, a, a work is going to be prioritized to do only unit test. Right. But then if on new code you have unit test or if you're going to revisit old code for refactoring or increase some functionality there, you can put unit test. So in a nutshell, if you change any code or if you add any code, you put unit tests. You can parallelize the test. So Selenium Grid enables you to do parallelization of tests. That means that if you have 100 uh, Selenium tests, you can say to Selenium Grid, hey, I have five machines and I have all this set of tests and Selenium Grid is going to by itself uh, send the tests to the machine and try to divide the equally. So uh, it's going to be like uh, 20 tests per machine if I have five machines. Uh, if, you have, if your system has an API, use the API for your tests. So we can use the API for support, like uh, for setup uh, your environment or for checking something. So you, you deleted something, you don't need to go through the UI again to check if it was deleted. You can actually go straight to the API and check there if it was deleted. Right? Go to your API if if you don't you do not want to check the UI itself. You want to check the data. 
or you only care about the data. If you care about the UI, then you have to use Selenium. But if you only care about the data, use the API. Separated functional tests by jobs. So if you have a lot of functional tests, separate it by jobs, right? And the first thing you should do is separate your, your UI from your API, right? So you can, uh, if you have API tests and UI tests, don't put in one single job. Put the API first because it's faster, and then you call and then you call the job for the API. I'll also revisit your strategy, right? You might have a lot of UI tests that they can become API tests. So remove those from the from the UI and put those on the UI. Sorry, and put those on the API. Uh, in a nutshell, if you don't care about the UI, how it looks, or, or, or the not necessarily how it looks, because you can you cannot do a lot of stuff related to how it looks in the in the Selenium. Some of the stuff you can do, but if you don't care about simulating the user interaction, do it API right. Go uh, put those tests on the API and leave only what's necessary on the UI level and everything related to the data, to the functionality of the system, to the core thing, uh, put on the API. Of course, you can put lower again if you have access to more more down the pyramid, if you have access to uh, the code base and you can, you can create PRs or you can create the tests there, just try to uh, balance the test uh, to all the levels of the pyramid. Right, so we can, separ we can separate the jobs by the feature that's going to be released. You can separate it by the most uh, the feature with most revenue or the feature with most issues. And you can also do a sanity test, just the basics of what your user is going to do. You can execute that too. So how that would look like? Again, we have a, a, a repo, which is the trigger of, of your pipeline. And first, I'm going to do a sanity check. So now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check if everything passes, right? Uh, sorry, if the basics of what my user is going to do on my system passes. If it passes, I can move forward. If not, just uh, just fix it, right? Break the pipeline, and there is no uh, reason to go forward with this because the most basic thing that your user is going to do is already broken. Then we can call the feature that's going, that has more revenue, bringing more money to the company. Then the feature that's going to be released, you have a new feature that's going to be released uh, in the next month and you want to check that, then you can, you can do that. And remember that the ability to separate this by jobs comes from your code, right? So uh, in, the, in the test, in, in the refresher uh, series that I did, I showed that Gradle, uh, for instance, you can do that in, with Maven as well, but you can separate it, uh, the test execution by tasks, right? So we can say, I want to execute only the test on this file. I want to execute the test only in this feature. I want to execute the test only with those tags. So that gives the ability to create different jobs and you can just give it the, the greater command, for instance, that's going to be executing that job. And you can change the order in the way you pleased. Right, so we check the feature that's going to be released. Now I test my whole regression. Everything else that I have, I, I can put it here because now I already know that the most important thing for my deployment, it's already passing. So now I deploy to QA and I do my exploratory. Cool. So if I do all of that, we will have a, the ideal test pyramid after all. After all. Unfortunately not, right? What are you going to have? You're going to have something similar to this one, which is a cupcake. The same rules applies, right? Uh, as the other ones, just the amount of level, the amount of tests that you have in each one. So we said that you had a cone and now you start creating unit tests. So now you have more unit tests here. Of course, you're going to be creating be creating more UI and API tests, but then if you have more unit, this is going to be expanding until it, become, it becomes more like a square and then becomes the ideal test pyramid. Right? So it's important for you to revisit this strategy and how your, your format, the, the shape of a pyramid is, because that's your strategy, right? And you're going to see if it's working or not, if you, if you need to uh, pay some attention, if you need to do some tweaking. 
right? But Rafael, what if I have multiple services, right? So there is a book uh, by Sam Newman called Microservices. There is uh, there is a chapter about testing, and he, he talks about uh, how can you do a multiple uh, uh, how can you do multiple services strategy or microservices strategy, right? So in a nutshell, we have a you have, have two services here. You have service A and service B. Service A is on the ideal test pyramid. Service B is on the ice cream cone, meaning that they have different testing strategy, right? But as long as uh, they do contract testing, they have their communication. It's happening, right? So if all of my services are on the ideal test pyramid, I'm testing everything that matters. And if I do contract testing between those services, uh, according to Sam Newman in his book, you don't necessarily need to do end-to-end uh, -end testing between A and B because you already cover A with the test that it needs isolated. You already cover B with the test that, is, that it needs isolated as well. And the contract test is also uh, checking the, the communication be between those two. So now I have another service, it's on the cupcake, but I do contract test to make sure the communication is happening. So I can I can focus on the C itself and not uh, do a bunch of end-to-end -end tests to make sure that the communication is happening. And now I have another service, which is a, a square test pyramid, let's say, that also is important to do contract testing. Of course, what I'm showing here is they, they have different uh, shapes of the pyramid in each every, in every one of those, but if you have a reliable testing strategy, if you do contract testing, it's going to uh, be reliable that the communication is happening. You can do also instead of doing contract test, you can create an API. So let's uh, sorry a a library. So let's say that instead of B providing a a REST API for service A to call. B could provide a library which service A would install that library right? and then it's going to use as any other library that install on a system. Uh, but that means that now B has to, instead of only doing the contract testing, B needs to test the library. So one question, food for thought, is the pyramid still relevant today? That depends on my opinion. Right? So let's take a look at the relevance of the pyramid. So Martin Fowler talked about the test pyramid in 2012, which it's been a long time ago. I took a look at some recent, more recent articles, and they pretty much talk about the same core idea. In today's UI, you have white box testing. You have Angular, you have Node, you have React. In all of those, you have unit test level on the UI. So they are fast and they are cheap. So is the, the shape of the pyramid still relevant? Because we talk about that the UI is more on, on the top of the pyramid. But now, because they are, they are slow to create and slow to execute. But now that our UIs also have uh, unit tests, does it make sense to put it more on the bottom of the pyramid because they are fast to create and fast to execute. So the pyramid shape is the way that you organize is not about the level of the testing you are testing UI are going to be on the top. It's mainly about the fast feedback, right? Everything related that we are talking about, you're talking about fast feedback. My pipeline needs to be fast, needs to finish in 10, 15, 20 minute stops. So if my test is faster, then I can put them towards the bottom, right? And how that would look like, right? So we, one, one thing that we could do is you have a, a report story push that's going to trigger at the same time your backend test and your JavaScript test. And after that, it's going to trigger everything else, but they are going to be at, trigger at the same time those two, this one and this one is going to be triggered at the same time because both of them are fast to create, fast to execute. So it makes sense to execute them first. Right? So, and, and I'm not even going in, into other aspect of the UI to, uh, today's technology, right? So the shape of the pyramid has changed. 
Another thing is, uh, is your project a monolith, right? So if your project is a monolith, it makes sense to have the uh, to have a, the ideal test pyramid because you have it's a monolith. You have a lot of code there, so the code base is huge, and you don't want to have a lot of time. Uh, you don't want to wait a lot of time to execute your your whole test. So if you have a, everything on the UI level is going to take forever. It's going to be flaky. Right? Then you you want to be mindful or more mindful of the shape of the pyramid. But if you have a microservices project does it really matter so let's talk about specific about microservice does it really matter the shape let's talk about the fast feedback talk about that what's important for the pipeline and for the for uh, for using your your test strategy on a daily basis is a fast feedback so microservice by the name it's a service that's micro so the code base is small right so that means that I only care. It's going to be. I, it's not. It's going to be fast by nature because it has less code. And once that service is going to uh, becomes bigger, usually it's broken into another service. So does it matter the shape of the pyramid? Does it matter if we we are too mindful of how how the test pyramid looks like in that project? Or should we only care about the fast feedback, right? Because let's say that I, I put the test in every level of the pyramid that I want. Doesn't I, I don't really care about the shape. If I if I want to integrate with my database, I'm just going to put a test that integrates with, with my database. I'm not going to uh, do a isolated unit test. If I want to check. Uh, instead of doing a unit test for my controller and a unit test for my for my model, I just do an integration test that my controller is going to call my my unit. So if I do all of that in my my whole test suite, are less than ten minutes for everything that I have. Do I really care, or should I really care about the the shape? I don't know. I think um, I don't need to care because I care about the fast feedback. I, I care to tell the developer who coded that my CI is healthy and if something breaks, it's going to break really fast. So if we achieve that, I'm happy with my test strategy and I'm happy with the fast feedback that the developer is going to have, then I really don't care much about the shape of the pyramid. So. Yeah, so something just for you to think about it. Uh, food for thought, playing devil's advocate after doing a 20 minute presentation about the test pyramid. At the very end, I say, yeah, it doesn't matter again. So, so yeah, the references that I took, it's Sam Newman's uh, book, uh, Torque's uh, website, uh, Martin Fowler's, and, and some other fields. Thank you for watching this far. Uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. If you like it, give the thumbs up and I see you on the next video. Thank you.